because parents are busy and because parents feel comfortable simply throwing up their hands and saying, I don't know what the best way to raise them is, what we wind up doing is outsourcing parenting to different quote unquote experts. Mm -hmm. And then when we look at how our kids spend most of their time during the day, an average of 10 hours a day for kids under the age of 13, it's absorbing messages from the media. Now, every single media vehicle that a child is exposed to is providing worldview messaging. Hey everyone, this is Yvette Hampton. Welcome back to the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. I am back with Dr. George Barna. And if you missed Monday's episode, you've got to go back and listen to that. We're talking about worldview and the importance of it. And you might be thinking, yeah, I know, you guys talk about worldview all the time on this podcast. Um, Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit more deeply about it this week. So just keep listening. Uh, Dr. Barna, he is truly the expert on research that has been conducted um, by him and and by uh, other people. I know he's had other people help him with his research, of course, Um, but he really is the expert on uh, why our culture is where it is today. Like, how did we get here? And I know so many parents are asking that question. Like, how did we get to where we are today? Why, why, why are we struggling so much as a nation? Why are families struggling so much? Why are families hurting so desperately? Even Christian homeschool families, we have Lots, I mean, most of our friends are Christian homeschool families, and we talk to these people and we pray for each other. And I can't tell you how often I get uh, text messages or emails or Facebook messages from people that, who are just saying, can you just pray for us? Our family is hurting. And some of that, of course, is that we just live in a sinful world. And so that that is what it is. But much of it, I think, is because a lot of us were not raised with a solid, strong Christian biblical worldview. And as parents, we're still trying to figure out sometimes what that looks like. And as Dr. Barna mentioned, in order to pass that on to our kids, we have to have that strong worldview ourselves as parents. And so we're going to talk about what that looks like uh, to, to have that worldview ourselves, and then how we pass that on to our kids, how that worldview is developed. Um, We're going to talk about discipleship um, and what it means to be a disciple of Christ and how we can help our kids to become disciples of Christ. And so, so much good stuff to talk about. So we're going to keep going. But before we do, I want to say thank you to our sponsor, CTC Math. If you're looking for a great online math program, visit ctcmath.com and try them out for free. They offer a 12-month, 100% money-back guarantee. Um, So if it doesn't work for your family, they will refund all of your money. Uh, We use it in our home and we love it ctcmath.com. Well, Dr. Barnett, welcome back. It is such a privilege talking to you. Um, let's talk about, let's talk about America. Let's talk about why most Americans really lack this kind of biblical coherent worldview. Again, we say, oh, well, you know, we, we were raised in America. We live in a Christian nation. We go to church on Sunday, but then we see it played out in culture and we're just scratching our heads going, how in the world did we get here? You know, is it because of churches? Is it because of pastors? Uh, What's going on? And then how do we get back to the foundation of God's word? Yeah, that's not a simple question to answer because there (laughs) are so many things that feed into the answer. Sure. But I would say some of the significant elements to consider are number one, when you talk about worldview in our culture today, most people roll their eyes. It's not something that we talk about. It's not something that we think about. It's not something that we have standards for that we hold people to. And so the unfortunate reality is that in America today, worldview develops by default. Parents aren't really shepherding or directing that process Churches aren't directing or focused on that process. Even in our culture, even though it has a dramatic impact on the formation of people's worldview, most of that is unintentional. And so it's this default process. Now, is that different than the way it used to be? Yes, it is. You know, as you look over the course of decades or generations, however you want to measure things, what we've seen is that this used to be an undertaking that parents took seriously. They thought about what is the core belief structure and behavioral structure of my children. I'm responsible for that. So I'm going to look carefully at that and I'm going to invest heavily in that. But we've gotten away from that. 
to the point where, you know, one of the things I talk about in that book, Raising Spiritual Champions, is that the primary parenting approach in America today is outsourcing, mm -hmm. where parents love their kids. I'm not doubting that. Sure. I mean, we found that in the research. Yeah, for sure. But because parents are busy and because parents feel comfortable simply throwing up their hands and saying, I don't know what the best way to raise them is, what we wind up doing is outsourcing parenting to different, quote unquote, experts. And so when it comes to education, which we think is terribly important, we hire tutors. When it comes to athletics, which we think is very important, we hire personal coaches. When it comes to their hobbies, you know, whether it's playing the violin or learning chess or whatever it may be, you know, we hire tutors or mentors that we bring in for that. And so we're hiring all these people. Each of those people is bringing in a different worldview. Mm -hmm. And then when we look at how our kids spend most of their time during the day, an average of 10 hours a day for kids under the age of 13, it's absorbing messages from the media. Now, every single media vehicle that a child is exposed to is providing worldview messaging. And uh, one of the chapters in the book, I talk about a research study that we did. It's a form of research called content analysis, where we identified the most popular media that children are being exposed to in America today. Mm -hmm. And we analyzed the content of the messages being sent by those media vehicles, whether it was television programs, movies, video games, songs, the whole shop. And what we discovered is that the vast, vast, vast majority of the media messages being sent are anti-biblical. They're mm -hmm. unbiblical. They're right. Marxist, they're secular humanist, they're postmodernists, they're Eastern mystical, all these different places that they're coming from. And occasionally a biblical thought breaks through you know, usually related to some little morality situation of what's good or bad, right. but it doesn't relate it specifically back to the Bible. And then it goes on to the rest of the messaging that comes from other sources. So, yeah. you know, when we look at the big picture, that's what's happening is that churches really aren't players in the moral development of our children. We can talk more about that if you want. Yeah. Uh, you know, families have essentially abdicated the mantle of moral developer or spiritual developer of their children to people who they think are experts, including pastors. You know, yep. they say, well, that's your job, not my job. You know, it's not biblically, but that's that's what they believe. Right. And while all of that busyness is going on, meanwhile, the media are twisting the minds and hearts of our children. And I keep harking back to children because by the age of 13, their worldview is formed. Yeah. Uh, and and so it's vitally important that we take back those reins and say, yeah. no, 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 no. You cannot have access to my child's mind 10 hours a day. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. You cannot come in here and tutor, coach, mentor my child with those errant perspectives. We have to do a better job as parents of filtering out who's going to be allowed to have influence on our children. Yeah. Satan is so clever because the messages are so subtle. It's not like they're coming in and saying, you know, here's my worldview and I'm going to express it to you and teach it to you. They are so subtle. And I think most people don't even realize that they're expressing their worldview, you know, through their TikTok videos and through, um, you know, their Instagram posts and all the things that our kids are being exposed to through cartoons that, that the little ones are being exposed to. And uh, it, it's so hard um, it, it, because we can't keep our kids from everything. I mean, they see things because we live in the world. <laughs> and so, right. you know, we can't right. shelter them from everything. We can't keep them in a bubble. But it is one of the reasons why we are so passionate about home education and family discipleship, because we know that God has given us not just the responsibility, but the privilege to be able to raise our kids and to point them to Jesus for as many hours in the day as we possibly can. And then as they're exposed to those things, we get to help guide their hearts and train them and point them back to truth. So we're going to keep talking about it, but first we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. We want to thank all of our sponsors for making this show possible. BJU Press Homeschool, CTC Math, Apologia, and IEW. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do this. Visit the show notes for links to these great companies and thank them for supporting the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. 
We are back with Dr. George Barna. And uh, man, this is such good information. And it's so much fun talking to you. I, I've I've read so many of your studies and read your book. And so it's really fun to get to just sit and talk with you almost in person. We were just talking on the break about how you are in California and, and we, you're, you're near the beach and we miss the beach. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I told you, you have to go to the beach for me and, and visit the ocean. Go say hi to Excellent. the Pacific for Excellent me. Excellent assignment. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about how a child's worldview is developed, because obviously it's developed by the things that they're exposed to, but there's so much more than that. It's more than just saying, oh, it's just the things that they see during the day. How does a child really develop their worldview? You said by the age of 13, uh, a, a child's worldview is really already established. How is that? You know, it's interesting that because discipleship is discipleship. And so whether we're talking about children or adults, are there adaptations that need to be made? Yeah. But the basic approach I've discovered through this research is the same. And so what that means is if you're going to make a disciple, you first of all need to establish a relationship with that person. And that relationship needs to be based on trust. One of the things that that shocked me, frankly, from the research with parents and children that we did last year, is that most kids in America no longer trust their parents. And the reason for that is think about what kids are going through. They're trying to figure out how the world works, who they are, how they fit in it who they're going to grow up to be, what they want to do, why it matters, what doesn't matter, all these big questions of life. So every day they're looking for clues that will answer those questions. And their natural tendency is to turn first to their parents because they live with them. Uh, their parents are constantly trying to guide them in some way, and they built some trust with them. But what most kids have discovered is when it comes to the worldview questions, the philosophy of life types of things, there's no sense paying attention to their parents. And the reason is because they hear their parents tell them one thing, but then they watch them do something different. Mm. And the way that we discovered children interpret that is, oh, my gosh, my parents are as confused as I am. <laughs> well, I guess I better not pay attention to them they're going to have to try to work it out just like I'm trying to work it out. I've got to find people who have already figured it out. And that of that is why the arts and entertainment media have such powerful impact on the lives of kids. Because when they watch a 90-minute movie or a 30-minute streaming program or they listen to a three-minute song, they play a video game for 15 or 20 minutes, all the different media that they're exposed to, in those media... As we were doing our content analysis of those, one thing we discovered is that they're very consistent in the worldview that they push. Mm -hmm. And so to children, they interpret that as saying, ah, they figured out part of the secret of life. I'm going to pay attention to them because they know the answers. That's why media are so scary yeah. uh, for, for us as parents and grandparents is because they are literally reshaping the brain waves, the thinking, the thought processes, and the spiritual perspectives of our children through that quote unquote entertainment content. It's more than just entertainment. They are teaching our kids worldview. And so when you're trying to disciple a child, you got to build that trust. But part of building trust is being consistent in what you say and think and do. So if you want to be an effective discipler, know what you believe and live it consistently. But part of discipling also is what you might think of as one-on-one -on -one coaching. Our research has found that disciple making happens through one-on-one -on -one relationships. It doesn't tend to happen in groups, whether it's a, you know, a congregational meeting like a Sunday service or a small group that meets during the week. Those are fine, but they don't build disciples. It's that one-on-one -on -one relationship that builds the disciples. So mm -hmm. as a parent, you've got to think about, I am my child's spiritual coach. Mm -hmm. I am the one who has to take responsibility for that and always be evaluating, what am I trying to accomplish? How am I going to do that? How do I know whether or not it's working? We know that that means it's going to take a lot of investment of time. This isn't something you do on the fly. And that goes back to one of the mentalities 
that successful discipling parents have, according to my research, which is that they recognize as part of their core identity, number one, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. Number two, I'm a parent of my child. Number three, I am the primary discipler of my child. When yeah. that's your identity, that goes a long way toward reshuffling your schedule and helping you to rethink, what am I doing right now that's important toward meeting the objectives that I've set? Now, when you're trying to disciple the child, what do you do? The same thing that everybody tries to do in discipling because it, it, it works and it's important. You go back to the Bible, you use biblical principles, you use biblical stories as well as personal stories to illustrate those principles, what they are and what they look like in practice. And then you have what I call Socratic dialogue with your child, which means you're not always telling them, do this, do that, do this. The Bible says, you know, that can only go so far before you turn the person off. Yeah. Socratic dialogue is where you're getting those principles across by the questions that you're asking the child. Mm -hmm. It's like, so what did you want to accomplish in that situation, Johnny? It's like, why did you think that was the right thing to do? How mm -hmm. did that work for you? What might have been another approach? Yeah. Well, what do you think scripture would say about that or God would teach about that? Or are there any examples you could think of where Jesus was in a situation like that? Tell me how he handled it. I mean, it's those kinds of questions as opposed to saying, do A, B, C. You know, right. when you ask those kinds sure. of questions and that's the, the, the foundation of that relationship, what you're doing is you're teaching your child to think biblically. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want to leave with them. They can't always have you present. They can't always call you on the cell phone and say, hey, mom or dad, what should I do? I'm in this situation. It's fine if they do that, but it's not going to happen very often. What you want to do instead is to prepare them to make the right decisions, to think biblically about every situation you find them in. And then, uh, of course, as the discipler, you have to constantly be consistently modeling the things that you're trying them to embrace. So that's what we've discovered about how you're going to raise your child up to be a spiritual champion. You're the one who's got to do it. You've got to be totally focused on it. You got to go into it with a plan. It doesn't yeah. happen by default. It doesn't happen spontaneously. Plan out where you're going with your child spiritually. Yeah, yeah. Being intentional is so important. And it's so interesting. You talk about how the media has such an impact in the way that our kids think. And they think of, of media as the experts and things. And that goes back to homeschooling. And one of the reasons why we believe that homeschooling is so important is because when we send our kids off to a school, whether a public school or private school, we're saying to the kid, and we, we talk about this in our movie, we have a movie called Schoolhouse Rocked. Uh, it's called Schoolhouse Rocked, the homeschool revolution. And in the movie, we talk about how when you send your kids out into the school, you're saying to that child, this is the expert, your, your teacher is the expert. And we're going to trust that teacher to teach you no matter what their worldview is. And that's a very scary thing because we're now saying whatever they say to you is true. So just like they teach you two plus two equals four, if they tell you that evolution is how we got here, a child can't differentiate between truth of math and truth of how we got here because we've just said to them, trust your teacher, right? And so it's so important. It's why we are so passionate about homeschooling and discipling our kids every day and not handing them off to someone else to have someone else disciple them. Um, I want to dig in pretty deeply to church and how church is having an impact on our kids today, because I, I oftentimes, and we've seen this for generations, is that parents are putting their kids in church. They're saying the pastor or youth pastor, again, we're going to trust them to teach you truth. And many of them are teaching them truth and praise God for those pastors and uh, leaders who are really discipling our kids and coming alongside of us to do that, not doing it for us, but coming alongside of us to help us speak life and truth into our kids. Uh, but I think too many parents have just thrown up their hands and said, oh, it's not my job. You know, I'm going to put my kids in school during the week and then they'll go to youth group on Wednesday night, church on Sunday morning, and we'll pray before meals and we'll, we'll call it good. 
Um, and we're seeing that the, it's not working. I mean, those kids are just walking away in droves. And so, so I want to talk more about that. And I want to talk more about discipleship, actually, when we come back. Uh, but we're out of time for today. So Dr. Barna, thank you again so much for being with us today. Uh, you guys, again, the book is called Raising Spiritual Champions, Nurturing Your Child's Heart, Mind, and Soul. If you have not yet ordered this book, maybe after Monday, you were like, oh yeah, I got to get that book. If you haven't done that, if it's in your cart, go to your cart and actually push the purchase now button and, <laughs> and get it. Cause you guys, this is a book that every parent uh, needs to read. And I think it's one that my husband and I will be referring to over and over again, because our parenting journey is far from over. So Dr. Barna, thank you again for uh, your years and years of research and wisdom uh, that you have shared with us. Tell us again, really quickly where we can find out more about you. Uh, you can go to culturalresearchcenter.com. That's uh, part of Arizona Christian University where I teach and uh, do the research. And we have a lot of free research there that you can take advantage of. And if you want the book, you can uh, go to amazon.com. It's available as a paperback or in digital versions. And I hope that you'll get a copy of it and read it and most importantly, apply it. Yeah, it's not as fun to highlight on a digital book, though, as it is in a paper book. <laughs> My husband and I, we are, are a house divided when it comes to digital books and uh -huh. actual paper books. I'm a paper book kind of girl, and he loves digital, so um, so it's pretty funny. But anyway, thank you. Uh, you guys stay tuned to the very end to hear what's coming up tomorrow on the Schoolhouse Rock podcast with Dr. Barna. Thank you for being with us. If you have not left a review for this podcast, would you please do that? Just take a minute. Uh, go to where you can leave a review um, on whatever platform you're listening to this and uh, tell people how this podcast has impacted you so that they can be encouraged as well. Have a great afternoon and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Bye. Often when I speak and I talk about the need to equip ourselves with a biblical worldview and, I, and I'll mention to my audience that we got to recognize that around 90% of kids from church homes go to the public schools. And in those public schools, in a real sense, secularism, naturalism, atheism is the new religion of that system. The system itself is inherently atheistic because the system itself assumes right up front that you don't need God to explain anything, that you can explain all things, biology, anthropology, astronomy, mathematics, uh, everything without God, without the Bible. That is the religion of humanism, naturalism, atheism. And for so many Christian parents, when we send our kids to that system, they're there for almost 40 hours a week, nine months out of the year, uh, and they're getting really hit with this atheistic worldview and all the reasons, really, the atheistic worldview must be true. And if that's true, then the Bible can't be true. As we've interviewed senior pastors across the country, what we found is that there are five things that most churches measure in order to determine whether or not they're an effective ministry. More than four out of five senior pastors tell us that their church is very effective in ministry. And when we ask them, well, that's great, but on what basis do you make that claim? The five things are that they have growing numbers in terms of how many people show up, how much money they raise, how many programs they offer, how many staff people they've hired, and how much square footage they've built out. Yeah. I'm a measurement guy, so I'm, I'm glad they're measuring things. But as a measurement guy, I know you get what you measure. You only measure the things that you think are vitally important and that you're going to invest heavy resources into. Mm -hmm. And the problem with those five measures that churches use is that Jesus didn't die for any of them. Mm -hmm. 